Chapter 9, Part 1 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 9, Part 1. It is impossible to reconcile the mind of the native slave to the idea of living in a state of perfect equality and boundless affection with the white people. Heaven will be no heaven to him if he is not to be avenged of his enemies. I know from experience that these are the fundamental rules of his religious creed, because I learned them in the religious meetings of the slaves themselves. A favorite and kind master or mistress may now and then be admitted into heaven, but this rather as a matter of favor to the intercession of some slave than as matter of strict justice to the whites, who will by no means be of an equal rank with those who shall be raised from the depths of misery in this world. The idea of a revolution in the conditions of the whites and the blacks is the cornerstone of the religion of the latter, and indeed it seems to me, at least, to be quite natural, if not in strict accordance with the precepts of the Bible. For in that book I find it everywhere laid down that those who have possessed an inordinate portion of the good things of this world, and have lived in ease and luxury at the expense of their fellow men, will surely have to render an account of their stewardship, and be punished for having withheld from others the participation of those blessings which they themselves enjoyed. There is no subject which presents to the mind of the male slave a greater contrast between his own condition and that of his master than the relative station and appearance of his wife and his mistress. The one, poorly clad, poorly fed, and exposed to all of the hardships of the cotton field, the other, dressed in clothes of gay and various colors, ornamented with jewelry and carefully protected from the rays of the sun and the blasts of the wind. As I have before observed, the Africans have feelings peculiar to themselves, but with an American slave, the possession of the spacious house, splendid furniture, and fine horses of his master are but the secondary objects of his desires. To fill the measure of his happiness and crown his highest ambition, his young and beautiful mistress must adorn his triumph and enliven his hopes. I have been drawn into the above reflections, by the recollection of an event of a most melancholy character, which took place when I had been on this plantation about three months. Among the house servants of my master was a young man named Hardy, of a dark yellow complexion, a quadroon or mulatto, one-fourth of whose blood was transmitted from white parentage. Hardy was employed in various kinds of work about the house, and was frequently sent on errands, sometimes on horseback. I had become acquainted with the boy who had often come to see me at the quarter, and had sometimes stayed all night with me, and often told me of the ladies and gentlemen who visited at the great house. Amongst others, he frequently spoke of a young lady who resided six or seven miles from the plantation, and often came to visit the daughters of the family in company with her brother, a lad about twelve or fourteen years of age. He described the great beauty of this girl, whose mother was a widow, living on a small estate of her own. This lady did not keep a carriage, but her son and daughter, when they went abroad, traveled on horseback. One Sunday, these two young people came to visit at the house of my master, and remained until after tea in the evening. As I did not go out to work that day, I went over to the great house and from the house to a place in the woods about a mile distant where I had set snares for rabbits. This place was near the road, and I saw the young lady and her brother on their way home. It was after sundown when they passed me, but as the evening was clear and pleasant, I supposed they would get home soon after dark, and that no accident would befall them. No more was thought of the matter this evening, and I heard nothing further of the young people until the next day, about noon when a black boy came into the field where we were picking cotton and went to the overseer with a piece of paper. In a short time the overseer called me to come with him, and leaving the field with the hands under the orders of Simon, the first captain, 
we proceeded to the great house. As soon as we arrived at the mansion, my master, who had not spoken to me since the day we came from Columbia, appeared at the front door and ordered me to come in and follow him. He led me through a part of the house and passed into the back yard, where I saw the young gentleman, his son, another gentleman whom I did not know, the family doctor, and the overseer, all standing together and in earnest conversation. At my appearance, the overseer opened a cellar door and ordered me to go in. I had no suspicion of evil and obeyed the order immediately, as indeed I must have obeyed it, whatever might have been my suspicions. The overseer and the gentleman all followed, and as soon as the cellar door was closed after us by someone whom I could not see, I was ordered to pull off my clothes and lie down on my back. I was then bound by the hands and feet with strong cords, and extended at full length between two of the beams that supported the timbers of the building. The stranger, who I now observed was much agitated, spoke to the doctor, who then opened a small case of surgeon's instruments, which he took from his pocket and told me he was going to skin me for what I had done last night. But, said the doctor, before you are skinned, you had better confess your crime. What crime, master, shall I confess? I have committed no crime. What has been done that you are going to murder me, was my reply. My master then asked me why I had followed the young lady and her brother, who went from the house the evening before, and murdered her. Astonished and terrified at the charge of being a murderer, I knew not what to say, and only continued the protestations of my innocence and my entreaties not to be put to death. My young master was greatly enraged at me, and loaded me with maledictions and imprecations, and his father appeared to be as well satisfied as he was of my guilt, but was more calm and less vociferous in his language. The doctor during this time was assorting his instruments and looking at me. Then, stooping down and feeling my pulse, he said, It would not do to skin a man so full of blood as I was. I should bleed so much that he could not see to do his work, and he should probably cut some large vein or artery by which I should bleed to death in a few minutes. It was necessary to bleed me in the arms for some time so as to reduce the quantity of blood that was in me before taking my skin off. He then bound a string round my right arm, and opened a vein near the middle of the arm from which the blood ran in a large and smooth stream. I already began to feel faint with the loss of blood, when the cellar door was thrown open, and several persons came down with two lighted candles. I looked at these people attentively as they came near and stood around me, and expressed their satisfaction at the just and dreadful punishment that I was about to undergo. Their faces were all new and unknown to me, except that of a lad, whom I recognized as the same who had ridden by me the preceding evening in company with his sister. My old master spoke to this boy by name, and told him to come and see the murderer of his sister receive his due. The boy was a pretty youth, and wore his hair long on the top of his head, in the fashion of that day. As he came round near my head, the light of a candle which the doctor held in his hand shone full in my face, and seeing that the eyes of the boy met mine, I determined to make one more effort to save my life, and said to him, in as calm a tone as I could, Young master, did I murder young mistress, your sister? The youth immediately looked at my master and said, This is not the man. This man had short wool, and he had long wool, like your hearty. My life was saved. I was snatched from the most horrible of tortures and from a slow and painful death. I was unbound, the bleeding of my arm stopped, and I was suffered to put on my clothes and go up into the back yard of the house, where I was required to tell what I knew of the young lady and her brother on the previous day. I stated that I had seen them in the courtyard of the house at the time I was in the kitchen, that I had then gone to the woods to set my snares, and had seen them pass along the road near me, and that this was all the knowledge I had of them. The boy was then required to examine me particularly, and ascertain whether I was or was not the man who had murdered his sister. He said he had not seen me at the place where I stated I was, 
and that he was confident I was not the person who had attacked him and his sister, that my hair, or wool as he called it, was short, but that of the man who committed the crime was long, like Hardy's, and that he was about the size of Hardy, not so large as I was, but black like me, and not yellow like Hardy. Someone now asked where Hardy was, and he was called for, but could not be found in the kitchen. Persons were sent to the quarter and other places in quest of him, but returned without him. Hardy was nowhere to be found. Whilst this inquiry, or rather search, was going on, perceiving that my old master had ceased to look upon me as a murderer, I asked him to please tell me what had happened that had been so near proving fatal to me. I was now informed that the young lady who had left the house on the previous evening in company with her brother had been assailed on the road about four miles off by a black man who had sprung from a thicket and snatched her from her horse as she was riding a short distance behind her brother. That the assassin, as soon as she was on the ground, struck her horse a blow with a long stick, which, together with the fright caused by the screams of its rider when torn from it, had caused it to fly off at full speed and the horse of the brother also taking fright, followed in pursuit, notwithstanding all the exertions of the lad to stop it. All the account the brother could give of the matter was that as his horse ran with him, he saw the negro drag his sister into the woods and heard her screams for a short time. He was not able to stop his horse until he reached home, when he gave information to his mother and her family that people had been scouring the woods all night and all the morning without being able to find the young lady. When intelligence of this horrid crime was brought to the house of my master, Hardy was the first to receive it, he having gone to take the horse of the person, a young gentleman of the neighborhood, who bore it, and who immediately returned to join his friends in their search for the dead body. As soon as the messenger was gone, Hardy had come to my master and told him that if he would prevent me from murdering him, he would disclose the perpetrator of the crime. He was then ordered to communicate all he knew on the subject, and declared that, having gone into the woods the day before to hunt squirrels, he stayed until it was late, and on his return home, hearing the shrieks of a woman, he had proceeded cautiously to the place. But before he could arrive at the spot, the cries had ceased. Nevertheless, he had found me, after some search, with the body of the young lady whom I had just killed, and that I was about to kill him, too, with a hickory club. But he had saved his life by promising that he would never betray me. He was glad to leave me, and what I had done with the body he did not know. Hardy was known in the neighborhood, and his character had been good. I was a stranger, and on inquiry the black people in the kitchen supported Hardy by saying that I had been seen going to the woods before night by the way of the road which the deceased had traveled. These circumstances were deemed conclusive against me by my master, and as the offense of which I was believed to be guilty was the highest that can be committed by a slave according to the opinion of owners, it was determined to punish me in a way unknown to the law and to inflict tortures upon me which the law would not tolerate. I was now released, and though very weak from the effects of bleeding, I was yet able to return to my own lodgings. I had no doubt that Hardy was the perpetrator of the crime for which I was so near losing my life, and now recollected that when I was at the kitchen of the great house on Sunday, he had disappeared a short time before sundown, as I had looked for him when I was going to set my snares, but could not find him. I went back to the house and communicated this fact to my master. By this time, nearly twenty white men had collected about the dwelling with the intention of going to search for the body of the lost lady, but it was now resolved to make the lookout double, and to give it the twofold character of a pursuit of the living, as well as a seeking for the dead. I now returned to my lodgings in the quarter and soon fell into a profound sleep from which I did not awake until long after night, when all was quiet, and the stillness of undisturbed tranquillity prevailed over our little community. I felt restless and sunk into a labyrinth of painful reflections upon the horrid and perilous condition from which I had this day escaped, as it seemed, merely by chance. And as I slept until all sensations of drowsiness had left me, I rose from my bed 
and walked out by the light of the moon, which was now shining. After being in the open air some time, I thought of the snares I had set on Sunday evening and determined to go and see if they had taken any game. I sometimes caught possums in my snares, and as these animals were very fat at this season of the year, I felt a hope that I might be fortunate enough to get one tonight. I had been at my snares and had returned, as far as the road, near where I had seen the young lady and her brother on horseback on Sunday evening, and had seated myself under the boughs of a holly bush that grew there. It so happened that the place where I sat was in the shade of the bush within a few feet of the road, but screened from it by some small boughs. In this position, which I had taken by accident, I could see a great distance along the road, towards the end of my master's lane, though covered as I was by the shade and enveloped in boughs, it was difficult for a person in the road to see me. The occurrence that had befallen me in the course of the previous day had rendered me nervous and easily susceptible of all the emotions of fear. I had not been long in this place when I thought I heard sounds, as of a person walking on the ground at a quick pace and looking along the road towards the lane I saw the form of someone passing through a space in the road where the beams of the moon piercing between two trees reached the ground. When the moving body passed into the shade I could not see it, but in a short time it came so near that I could distinctly see that it was a man approaching me by the road. When he came opposite me and the moon shone full in his face I knew him to be a young mulatto named David the coachman of a widow lady who resided somewhere near Charleston, but who had been at the house of my master for two or three weeks as a visitor with her two daughters. This man passed on at a quick step without observing me, and the suspicion instantly riveted itself in my mind that he was the murderer for whose crime I had already suffered so much, and that he was now on his way to the place where he had left the body for the purpose of removing or burying it in the earth. I was confident that no honest purpose could bring him to this place at this time of night, alone. I was about two miles from home, and an equal distance from the spot where the girl had been seized. Of her subsequent murder, no one entertained a doubt, for it was not to be expected that the fellow who had been guilty of one great crime would flinch from the commission of another of equal magnitude and suffer his victim to exist as a witness to identify his person. I felt animated by a spirit of revenge against the wretch, whoever he might be, who had brought me so near to torture and death, and, feeble and weak as I was, resolved to pursue the footsteps of this coachman at a wary and cautious distance, and ascertain, if possible, the object of his visit to these woods, at this time of night. I waited until he had passed me more than a hundred yards, and until I could barely discover his form in the faint light of the deep shade of the trees, when, stealing quietly into the road, I followed, with the caution of a spy traversing the camp of an enemy. We were now in a dark pine forest, and on both sides of us were tracks of low, swampy ground, covered with thickets so dense as to be difficult of penetration, even by a person on foot. The road led along a neck of elevated and dry ground, that divided these swamps for more than a mile when they terminated and were succeeded by ground that produced scarcely any other timber than a scrubby kind of oak called blackjack. It was amongst these blackjacks, about half a mile beyond the swamps, that the lady had been carried off. I had often been here for the purpose of snaring and trapping the small game of these woods, and was well acquainted with the topography of this forest for some distance on both sides of the road. It was necessary for me to use the utmost caution in the enterprise I was now engaged in. The road we were now traveling was in no place very broad, and at some points barely wide enough to permit a carriage to pass between the trees that lined its sides. In some places it was so dark that I could not see the man whose steps I followed, but was obliged to depend on the sound produced by the tread of his feet upon the ground. I deemed it necessary to keep as close as possible to the object of my pursuit, lest he should suddenly turn into the swamp, on one side or the other of the road, and elude my vigilance, for I had no doubt that he would quit the road somewhere. 
As we approached the termination of the low grounds, my anxiety became intense lest he should escape me, and at one time I could not have been more than one hundred feet behind him, but he continued his course until he reached the oak woods and came to a place where an old cart road led off to the left along the side of the dark swamp as it was termed in the neighborhood. This road the mulatto took without turning to look behind him. Here my difficulties and perils increased, for I now felt myself in danger, as I had no longer any doubt that I was on the trail of the murderer, and that, if discovered by him, my life would be the price of my curiosity. I was too weak to be able to struggle with him for a minute, though if the blood which I had lost through his wickedness could have been restored to my veins, I could have seized him by the neck and strangled him. The road I now had to travel was so little frequented that bushes of the ground oak and bilberry stood thick in almost every part of it. Many of these bushes were full of dry leaves, which had been touched by the frost but had not yet fallen. It was easy for me to follow him, for I pursued by the noise he made amongst these bushes. But it was not so easy for me to avoid on my part the making of a rustling and agitation of the bushes which might expose me to detection. I was now obliged to depend wholly on my ears to guide my pursuit, my eyes being occupied in watching my own way to enable me to avoid every object the touching of which was likely to produce sound. I followed this road more than a mile, led by the cracking of the sticks or the shaking of the leaves. At length I heard a loud, shrill whistle, and then a total silence succeeded. I now stood still, and in a few seconds heard a noise in the swamp like the drumming of a pheasant. Soon afterwards I heard the breaking of sticks and the sounds caused by the bending of branches of trees. In a little time I was satisfied that something having life was moving in the swamp and coming towards the place where the mulatto stood. This was at the end of the cart road and opposite some large pine trees which grew in the swamp at the distance of two or three hundred yards from its margin. The noise in the swamp still approached us, and at length a person came out of the thicket and stood for a minute or more with the mulatto whom I had followed, and then they both entered the swamp and took the course of the pine trees as I could easily distinguish by my ears. When they were gone, I advanced to the end of the road and sat down upon a log to listen to their progress through the swamp. At length it seemed that they had stopped, for I no longer heard anything of them. Anxious, however, to ascertain more of this mysterious business, I remained in silence on the log, determined to stay there until day, if I could not sooner learn something to satisfy me, why these men had gone into the swamp. All uncertainty upon this subject was, however, quickly removed from my mind, for within less than ten minutes, after I had ceased to hear them moving in the thicket, I was shocked by the faint but shrill wailings of a female voice accompanied with exclamations and supplications in a tone so feeble that I could only distinguish a few solitary words. My mind comprehended the whole ground of this matter at a glance. The lady, supposed to have been murdered on Sunday evening, was still living, and concealed by the two fiends who had passed out of my sight but a few minutes before. The one I knew, for I had examined his features within a few feet of me in the full light of the moon, and that the other was hardy, I was as perfectly convinced as if I had seen him also. I now rose to return home, the cries of the female in the swamp still continuing but growing weaker and dying away as I receded from the place where I had sat. I was now in possession of the clearest evidence of the guilt of the two murderers, but I was afraid to communicate my knowledge to my master lest he should suspect me of being an accomplice in this crime. And if the lady could not be recovered alive, I had no doubt that Hardy and his companion were sufficiently depraved to charge me as a participation with themselves to be avenged upon me. I was confident that the mulatto David would return to the house before day and be found in his bed in the morning, which he could easily do, for he slept in a part of the stable loft under pretense of being near the horses of his mistress. I thought it possible that Hardy might also return home that night, 
and endeavor to account for his absence from home on Monday afternoon by some ingenious lie, in the invention of which I knew him to be very expert. In this case I saw that I should have to run the risk of being overpowered by the number of my false accusers, and as I stood alone they might yet be able to sacrifice my life and escape the punishment due to their crimes. After much consideration I came to the resolution of returning, as quick as possible, to the quarter, calling up the overseer, and acquainting him with all that I had seen, heard, and done in the course of this night. As I did not know what time of night it was when I left my bed, I was apprehensive that day might break before I could so far mature my plans as to have persons to waylay and arrest the mulatto on his return home. But when I roused the overseer, he told me it was only one o'clock, and seemed but little inclined to credit my story. But after talking to me several minutes, he told me he, now more than ever, suspected me to be the murderer. But he would go with me and see if I had told the truth. When we arrived at the great house, some members of the family had not yet gone to bed, having been kept up by the arrival of several gentlemen who had been searching the woods all day for the lost lady, and who had come here to seek lodgings when it was near midnight. My master was in bed but was called up and listened attentively to my story, at the close of which he shook his head and said with an oath, You blank! I believe you to be the murderer, but we will go and see if all you say is a lie. If it is, the torments of blank will be pleasure to what awaits you. You have escaped once, but you will not get off a second time. I now found that somebody must die, and if the guilty could not be found, the innocent would have to atone for them. The manner in which my master had delivered his words assured me that the life of somebody must be taken. This new danger aroused my energies, and I told them that I was ready to go and take the consequences. Accordingly, the overseer, my young master, and three other gentlemen immediately set out with me. It was agreed that we should all travel on foot, the overseer and I going a few paces in advance of the others. We proceeded silently but rapidly on our way, and as we passed it, I showed them the place where I sat under the holly bush when the mulatto passed me. We neither saw nor heard any person on the road, and reached the log at the end of the cart road where I sat when I heard the cries in the swamp. All was now quiet, and our party lay down in the bushes on each side of a large gum tree at the root of which the two murderers stood when they talked together before they entered the thicket. We had not been here more than an hour when I heard, as I lay with my head near the ground, a noise in the swamp, which I believe could only be made by those whom we sought. I, however, said nothing, and the gentleman did not hear it. It was caused, as I afterwards ascertained, by dragging the fallen branch of a tree along the ground for the purpose of lighting the fire. The night was very clear and serene its silence only being broken at intervals by the loud hooting of the great long-eared owls, which are numerous in these swamps. I felt oppressed by the cold, and was glad to hear the crowing of a cock at a great distance announcing the approach of day. This was followed after a short interval by the cracking of sticks, and by other tokens which I knew could proceed only from the motions of living bodies. I now whispered to the overseer who lay near me, that it would soon appear whether I had spoken the truth or not. All were now satisfied that people were coming out of the swamp, for we heard them speak to each other. I desired the overseer to advise the other gentlemen to let the culprits come out of the swamp and gain the high ground before we attempted to seize them, but this counsel was unfortunately not taken, and when they came near to the gum tree, and it could be clearly seen that there were two men and no more, one of the gentlemen called out to them to stop, or they were dead. Instead, however, of stopping, they both sprang forward and took to flight. They did not turn into the swamp, for the gentleman who ordered them to stop was in their rear, they having already passed him. At the moment they had started to run, each of the gentlemen fired two pistols at them. The pistols made the forest ring on all sides and I supposed it was impossible for either of the fugitives to escape from so many balls. This was, however, not the case, 
for only one of them was injured. The mulatto David had one arm and one leg broken and fell about ten yards from us, but Hardy escaped, and when the smoke cleared away, he was nowhere to be seen. On being interrogated, David acknowledged that the lady was in the swamp on a small island and was yet alive, that he and Hardy had gone from the house on Sunday for the purpose of waylaying and carrying her off, and intended to kill her little brother, this part of the duty being assigned to him, whilst Hardy was to drag the sister from her horse. As they were both mulattoes, they blackened their faces with charcoal taken from a pine stump partially burned. The boy was riding before his sister, and when Hardy seized her and dragged her from her horse, she screamed and frightened both the horses, which took off at full speed by which means the boy escaped. Finding that the boy was out of his reach, David remained in the bushes until Hardy brought the sister to him. They immediately tied a handkerchief round her face so as to cover her mouth and stifle her shrieks, and taking her in their arms, carried her back toward my master's house, for some distance through the woods, until they came to the cart road leading along the swamp. They then followed this road as far as it led, and, turning into the swamp, took their victim to a place they had prepared for her the Sunday before, on a small knoll in the swamp, where the ground was dry. Her hands were closely confined, and she was tied by the feet to a tree. He said he had stolen some bread and taken it to her that night, but when they unbound her mouth to permit her to eat, she only wept and made a noise, begging them to release her, until they were obliged again to bandage her mouth. End of chapter 9, part 1 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista